Okay, I guess that we could start with our session uh, scheduled at 11 uh, related to uh, the new track operations. Uh, I kindly ask you to close, please, the door in order to reduce a bit the noise here and starting on time and to avoid stealing time to our speakers. So, good morning and welcome, everybody. I'm the Italian Navy Commander Stefano Biondi. I have been working here at the CCDCOE since three years as a cyber intelligence researcher. And today, host for this panel, Dark Web, any impacts for military operations? Uh, so far, we had the opportunity to attend panels uh, related to cyber domain uh, from different perspectives, the strategic vision rather than the legal implications or even the technical challenges and opportunities. But we are definitely missing a pillar, operations. Yesterday, we had a great talk in the afternoon with General Petreus and uh, Dr. Lin, uh, focused on cyber operations and information operations. Today, we're going to continue on this track, and we will have three panels uh, operations-oriented. The first one, this one, focus on dark web. And in the afternoon, we're going to have other two panels, always for topics related to operations. Uh, the first will be uh, social net network analysis and information warfare uh, oriented. And the third one related to the implication of the use of artificial intelligence, uh, the weaponization of artificial intelligence within military systems. But back to uh, our panel uh, today now. We, uh, we perfectly know that in the military domain, uh, one of the main uh, topics, one of the main uh, constraints is the collection gathering. Uh, gathering information, good information, is a must in order to plan operations and uh, to fill the gap to plan these, uh, these operations and uh, to get a good situation awareness picture. So, today, with this session, we will try to focus on these kind of considerations. And uh, the session itself will provide some insight uh, into the discovery of possible uh, threats for military operations within the dark web, and discussing feasible weaknesses uh, in this hidden area, and uh, identify possible solutions to mitigate the risks connected to, uh, with military operations. And from the Intel perspective, trying to understand if dark web is a good source for uh, Intel purposes, military intelligence. So, of course, for uh, achieving all these kind of uh, uh, questions, uh, I will not be here alone on the stage. With me, uh, from left to right, uh, Commander Dr. Robert Koch uh, from the Bundeswehr Cyber Security Center, uh, Dr. Andrea Melegari from Expert System, and Mr. John Greenup from the NATO Intelligence Fusion Center. Before starting with, uh, with the talks, uh, a quick remark about the organization of this panel. We're going to have uh, uh, three talks, 20 minutes each. And in the end of each speech, uh, we're going to have five, ten minutes uh, question time <clears throat> for each of our uh, uh, experts here. So let's try to maximize the opportunity to have those brilliant uh, experts here on the stage with us today and try to uh, raise questions, uh, intelligence and operations oriented. So. Uh, just a quick uh, uh, information about the panel itself. This panel has been thought to enlarge the vision of some questions that uh, have been uh, written in a paper that has been selected for our uh, proceeding. And you're going to have the, the, the proceeding book in your welcome package. Uh, and, this, uh, and of course, this paper is uh, in this book. The author of this uh, paper is uh, Commander Robert Koch, and today he is with us to provide the contents of this uh, document, of this uh, research, and the outcomes that uh, he got uh, in the end of this research. Robert is a general staff officer of the Federal Armed Forces and senior research assistant and lecturer in computer science 
at the Universitat der Bundeswehr and the University of Bonn. Uh, main area of interest for Robert are system security and intrusion detection in encrypted networks and artificial intelligence. The title of the paper and this presentation, of course, are Hidden in the Shadow, the Dark Web, a Growing Risk for Military Operations. The paper analyzes the technical base of the dark web and the, examines the possibilities to the, the, of the anonymization, driving a discussion of the potential risk for military operations. So please, Robert, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Dear ladies and gentlemen, When you're thinking about the dark web, you often have these typical pictures in the mind. Um, for example, the uh, trading with drugs on um, respective markets, um, selling of guns, and for example, we had um, during the um, Munich um, shootings a few years ago, also the information that the um, used weapon was also uh, bought via the dark web. So um, typically very bad um, things. Um, also Playpen was a, um, a very famous um, example when in 2015 the FBI took down um, that web page um, which contained a lot of child pornography. Um, after two years from 2017, the statistics are nearly 600 arrests um, corresponding with that um, takedown of the web page. Um, but before talking about the dark web in uh, some more detail, we have to um, have a look at the definitions because a lot of things are very often mixed in that area. Um, so the ClearNet is everything you um, can reach with your normal browser and you are doing a Google or a Bing search. Um, everything these engines, these crawlers can find. The deep web, um, that's much, much bigger than the um, actual ClearNet. Um, everything that is connected to the internet. Think, for example, about um, your intranet at your company and um, some private data at home of uh, your computers and stuff like that. So normally, that should be inaccessible by a search engine. Normally, of course. Um, so that's the deep web. The dark net, very often mixed with the dark web. The dark net are the IP addresses um, out there which are routable but not in use. So your computer needs IP addresses to send the messages through the internet. And um, some of these addresses are not in use. And these um, usable but not in use, um, these are um, building the dark net. And the dark web, finally, that are the websites um, which are hosted within so-called overlay networks, so a specific structure on top of the internet, which is normally only accessible by using special software like, for example, Tor. Also, the size is quite interesting. Um, Tor is the most famous um, dark web which is available. There are some more, but that's the most famous and the biggest one. And if you have a look to the numbers, about um, a timeline of two years, you can see, okay, maybe about 50,000 pages going up um, recently to about 100,000 in average. You can also identify some very um, sharp um, increases in the numbers here in the beginning, um, only for a one short time, and then two plateaus for a longer time. That quite often means that not um, 100,000 guys are putting a new content to the web to the exactly same time, but uh, that some um, nasty is going on, some attack is happening, um, the network is um, under heavy surveillance, so maybe a research institute or an agency is trying to do something more, or maybe someone is um, using the infrastructure um, to do um, attacks and therefore registering uh, new onion domains. Um, in fact, the dark web itself, as you can see, is quite small. And um, I put the numbers to the graph over there, and um, you see the clear net, so the stuff you can browse, in red, and the dark web in blue. And it, it's in blue, but the resolution of the beamer is too low, so you can't see the small part of it. So I give you the numbers. Um, in general this year, the clear net has about 1.9 billion websites. The dark web has about 105,000, and they are not with content, uh, maybe half of it. So um, the dark web is only about 0 0.005 um, of the amount of web pages out there. So it's really, really small. Um, so actually, um, you have that um, tip of the iceberg, and you should flip uh, that iceberg. 
Um, also interesting, a lot of bad things is going on there, but a lot of um, good police work is done. So on a regular basis, um, illegal services are shut down. One example, the Hansa Bay, um, that was a screenshot when the market was closed down. And I like um, the humor of our friends from the Netherlands that did a great job there. So you can um, even access a link with details about the arrests going on. And there are links to the um, courts at trial. So they are providing all the information and sending out a clear message, hey, we will catch you even if you are working in the dark web. And also, the identified buyers are noticed there, so giving a warning call, um, don't do that any longer. So a lot of police work is going on there. So if we are thinking about um, important and sensitive information which may inflict um, military missions, we really have to think about how secure is the dark web. Would you re really use such a mean um, to do um, actions that may inflict um, military operations? So first, I will give you a very, sh um, a very short look how Tor is working. So in principle, your computer is selecting three other machines. You know all of them. And then you build encrypted channels to everybody of these computers. And then you are sending messages to them. And um, the other guys only know the predecessor and the successor. So your computer knows all. But um, the other computers only know the predecessor and the successor. So if a message is going um, in an anonymized way out of the Tor network to the regular internet, the exit point, the last um, computer in the row, knows only the address where it should go in the internet and where it's coming from, from the middle guy, but not more information. So your IP address is, um, is um, faded out and nobody is able to um, identify you. On the other hand, um, there are a lot of possibilities to do some de-anonymization attacks. Um, three basic kinds can be differentiated. So um, the first one is if you really have vulnerabilities in Tor itself. So the software that provides these overlay networks or um, the respective protocol. An important example some time ago was the so-called relay early um, traffic confirmation attack. Um, that was a, um, a change in the uh, protocol that was necessary, but there was some um, stuff in there that you can exploit it to do a de-anonymization of the user. That was um, used in real life, and um, as soon as it was identified publicly, it was fixed. These errors are quite rare, but they happen. So errors in Tor itself, very, very dangerous if you are um, trying to get a good anonymity. Um, also on a technical base, but not focusing on the Tor software itself, is uh, vulnerabilities of used software. Um, normally you are using the Firefox browser to access the Tor network. You can just download it and start it, that's all. So very easy. And um, the most attack vectors are going to that additional software, the browser, browser plugins. So for example, the FBI used um, a technique they called network investigative technique um, to identify some users. In fact, that was quite funny because it was a very old um, exploit they used from a Metasploit service, publicly available, but because nobody used it, it was already retired. Um, at least it seems it was useful in that area. So um, basically, it was a flash plugin running in the browser, and you were able, with that little sheet of code over there, um, to identify the IP address of the user. So uh, vulnerability of the browser, respectively a plugin, but not of the Tor network itself. Um, the FBI, that was a playpen case, used that attack. Um, um, took over uh, uh, the Playpen web server and the dark web and was running it for 13 days to collect the IP addresses of the visitors. And um, after they finished, they had about 8,700 um, computers hacked in 120 countries. So some background information from the num numbers from the beginning. Another attack uh, possibility is very interesting, only the scheme here. Um, Think about you are accessing the network and your smartphone is on your table. And we have some stuff in the advertisement industry that's called ultrasound cross-device tracking. Um, because they want to connect all your uh, devices to you, um, you can nowadays embed 
a uh, sound file into an advertisement that is inaudible for human, but it is played when you are opening that adver advertisement. And it's unique for um, the computer the advertisement is sent to. So the idea is, um, you have the ad, the sound is played, you can't hear it, but your mobile phone is on your table beside you. The mobile phone can hear it, and it's sending back that unique code to the server that generated the code. And the server knows where it sent that code, so it can connect the two devices. And normally, you are not anonymized with your smartphone, so your smartphone tells the IP address that is used for accessing the internet um, from home. So a very, very interesting attack um, based on um, something which is an indirect shortcoming, but no direct uh, vulnerability. Third, of course, human error, um, the, my, the most often one. Um, a very funny example, uh, one drug dealer who used the dark web um, in the uh, United States was caught because um, poli uh, the post officers get suspicious that he put the parcels all the time with latex gloves on to the post office, um, not to have the um, fingerprints on it. And uh, that for they informed the police, they checked um, the guy and they identified, okay, um, he's selling the, the drugs. Um, which he is dealing over the dark web. So human error is definitely um, the most um, common um, error when uh, de-anonymization is possible in the dark web. There are um, multiple other opportunities. Um, for example, only giving a very uh, light idea about that, I did a research running about 1.5 years, um, analyzing how the routing is working in the, um, in the dark web, and um, how are the exit nodes used if you are using it for, uh, for anonymization. And as you can see, the blue part over there in the graph, that are exit nodes that are currently used. That means you have a very slow number, a very low number, only about 1,000 exit nodes in average in the dark web, in the, um, in the Tor network. And from these, only a very limited part is um, used. That means if you want to survey um, these, um, these exit nodes, it's quite easy. You only have to focus on a very limited number. Um, also, if you are thinking about the capabilities of the NSA, you will uh, for sure know the um, X key score. So the, that are definitions um, of, for example, IP addresses or terms um, they are looking for in the internet. And if they can see that in the traffic, um, they are going into the connection and you can do different things. And as you can see, if you have a look into the definitions, as far as we know from the leaks, um, there are, for example, things like Tails. And Tails is a distribution which is enabling Tor and trying to give the maximum security to, to, the, user, uh, to the user. So everything that is going out of the computer is routed through the Tor network. But first, you have to download the software. And that um, rule that is defined there is exactly looking if someone is connecting to the website and trying to download the software. So if you are able to um, intervene into that connection during the download process and, for example, do a rerouting and giving another um, download version, you can have a compromise even already by the download. So a lot of um, possibilities um, to attack uh, the security and the anonymity of the Tor web. Um, if we have a um, look at the range of services and data we can see there, a lot of studies highlight that there's a very large proportion of illicit activities. Um, for example, it's number 44%, 57%, or um, very shocking numbers. One research uh, some time ago presented that 80% of the traffic in the dark web is related um, to child pornography. Um, these, this, uh, these um, estimations are really difficult to make in real world. So um, measurements um, which are used to um, get these ideas, they are not possible in a direct way, only in um, indirect um, means. 
And you really have to think about how are the hidden service directories working. So for example, a request that is quite rare will produce more traffic than a request that is um, provided very often to the um, uh, service directories. That is often um, not handled the right way in these evaluations. Another aspect maybe missed in some of these uh, works is um, there are a lot of crawlers, um, law enforcement agencies, child protection agencies, who are also crawling the web and generating traffic. And therefore, mm, it's quite difficult to say that really such high amount is um, really an illicit um, and traffic part. I have some statistics over there from the Internet Watch Foundation. Um, they are going through the web, the clear net and the dark web, and trying to bring um, down as many URLs with child pornography as possible. And you see the numbers. Um, the URLs over there, that is in the clear net. And the dark web, the percentage they found there is very little, 0. Point something percent. So again, these numbers are very, very limited, while most of the stuff is just in the clear net. Um, and interesting to know, uh, one of the most active hidden services at all is the Facebook web page. So you can access Facebook as an anonymous service too, and uh, that's this one uh, with the most traffic in the um, dark web at all. Um, the trading amounts in the dark web can, quite, can be quite high, um, $500,000 um, a day and even more, and that's mainly for drugs and financial fraud. Uh, we can also identify, and it's more important um, when thinking about military missions again, um, personally identifiable information. And there are some analysis out there which identify that the largest footprint generated by these personal identifiable information is for um, the US Navy, US Army, and groups that are closely linked to the defense area. So maybe dangerous. Um, of course, there are other services um, offered, for example, um, um, malware frameworks or crime as a service, where you just pay some money to um, some guys and they will hack a website for you and things like that. Um, that's all possible, definitely. Um, if you have a closer look to the data, um, we can identify that some confidential data is in there. Um, normally, the uh, classification level is not too high, but um, it can be um, interesting data. There are sometimes sensitive information available on different projects or investigations. Um, but typically from random hacks or leaks. So if you want to take or find information, to uh, target a specific operation that may be quite difficult because the normal data is um, yeah, more random and not useful for that. Um, also, things like uh, system access and um, access credentials, we can find that in the um, dark web too um, to buy it, but um, also yeah, on our very random base. So it's quite difficult to say, OK, I have the network X and I need um, access uh, credentials for that, um, you can only try to um, engage a hacker um, that he's um, doing that one. Um, things like SCADA systems and um, other credentials are also available, but very, very rare. So um, these are very low numbers. So most data is personally identifiable information. Um, and if you think about that, it's quite obvious that, uh, that the government has the largest footprint because they just have so many employees. If you have a look to the number, the, um, the number of the um, US forces, including the reserve over there, in some, nearly 2.5 million people. And the average Fortune 500 company has about 50,000 people. The biggest one, about 400,000 something. Um, so the governmental area, it's much bigger with respect to the people who are working there. So it's just normal that the footprint will be bigger because the personal, um, personally identifiable information is from random hacks from Facebook to something. And <laughs> on a statistical base, it's very logical that um, we have bigger footprints for the uh, governmental services over there because of the uh, number of the employees. 
Um, of course, also whistleblowers are um, using the Tor network um, if they want to expose higher classified material. But normally, you are using only uh, services like SecureDrop or Global Leaks, um, which prevent your good um, anonymity. But um, they are not going to sell that stuff over the dark web. So only using it um, to have. Uh, um, anonymized connection to the media, but not working or selling that um, on the dark web. So um, most important is that the data may not be useful to directly endanger a selected mission. Um, the, because the network is very heavily surveyed, a lot of undercover agents are doing their job there, and you also have a lot of scams. So you can't be really sure that the information that you are um, buying there is correct. Um, there's a lot of honey tokens and honey data in there. That's a very good thing from a security aspect. Um, and it's not, so diff uh, it's not so easy to build up uh, reputation systems. In the area of drug trafficking, that's quite easy. Think about eBay. So these dark, net, um, these dark web um, platforms have um, reputation systems nowadays too. So if you are trading um, drugs on a daily basis, you have a lot of um, votes if you are doing a good or a bad job. Um, so you can have a good feeling if a vendor or also a buyer is a good or a bad one and if you will get um, what you are paying for. But on the other hand, that's much more difficult if you are thinking about selling or buying um, very high value data because that will be um, typically only one time or with a very low frequency. So you don't have the chance to build up that trust in the seller as it's possible with a reputation system, for example, for the drug trafficking. Um, much more difficult are the indirect endangerments um, with uh, um, personal identifiable information. Think, for example, about social engineering attacks. Um, that can be, of course, very useful if you, um, for example, identify some information from the leader of a mission or something like that. Um, you can work on that as an attacker. Um, it can um, generate reputational damage for the forces, of course, and um, especially with um, looking at um, hybrid warfare techniques, um, that can be very useful, but um, mainly for an indirect and net, not targeted um, attack to uh, some mission. Um, so, very important, dark web is um, very often heavily overrated, um, both from its size and also the analysis um, sometimes are not too good as they are working of, um, with data with very high uncertainty. Um, but another aspect, the way these services are working has changed um, not too long ago, so the new, the version 3 of these um, services hidden in the dark web is much more secure and provides a much better anonymity than the older ones. And um, the tracking opportunities and the attack opportunities um, really reduced. Um, that may increase the use of um, such services for um, also dealing information again, but we have to ask also, of course, um, if you set up a completely secret platform in nowhere on the dark web and you want to sell it, if nobody can find the data and data, who should buy it? So um, it's nice from that point of view that you have a perfect communication maybe out there, um, but if you want to um, deal with the data, um, you have to break out of that um, little anonymous place. So my recommendations um, with regard to uh, the dark web and the information there is um, a continuously tracking of all parts. So the clear net, of course, um, the deep web as far as it's, as it's possible, and of course the dark web to have early identifications if some data is lost and um, gets leaked to these areas. Um, therefore, the creation of fingerprints of sensitive files and the monitoring of it, and there are services available which can help um, to implement that. Um, very powerful is the implementation of honey tokens and uh, strategically placed decoys. So providing very real, real looking data with some beacon that it's calling home if it's um, opened or accessed by somebody. So you get a very early indication that something is happening and you can have a closer look uh, where are things going on and where it's coming from. 
And of course, the preparation and testing of action plans and guidelines. Um, how do I have to handle detected leaks? Which pro procedures uh, should I use to initiate the deletion of the data? Finally, you can also think about um, the use of Tor for offensive attacks, just um, doing the anonymization route and then, for, it, um, for example, uh, doing hacking attacks and stuff like that. So it can be very interesting um, for the uh, military to just um, monitor also um, exit nodes for signs of these attacks. Um, as I said, the number is low, that's not too, uh, too difficult. That may also be um, an opportunity. Of course, in the legal framework, it must be possible. Um, there's much more information in the paper. I invite everybody uh, to read it. And um, if you have questions, you can also come back to me um, on the topic later. Thank you very much. We can definitely open the question time with Robert. Uh, any questions from the audience, please? Okay, so I will give you some more minutes to think about some questions for Robert. I already have one. I mean, in the, first of all, I read, of course, the whole paper first. <laughs> so, and in the conclusion, as you said during your presentation, you talk about um, the data, a comprehensive data management strategy, and particularly uh, preparation, actions, plan, and uh, testing of these mm -hmm. procedures, strategy procedures, and uh, you know, could you explain a bit more in detail those kind of uh, preparation? What do you mm -hmm. mean more in concre concrete? Okay, that means. Um, um, be prepared um, what to do if such a leak is now identified. So uh, we have different means. You um, have different platforms which are regularly used where the data is um, uh, going when someone is, um, is um, um, offering it. So for example, all these paste bin sites. And you can implement quite easy monitoring mechanisms for um, these locations just to um, have an idea what's going on there. So you can reduce um, the uncertainty to what is going on and try to identify as early as possible, oh, there's something new. And then you should have um, a very good idea yeah, how to um, um, delete the stuff as far as possible. So for some providers, um, think about the Germany leaks, about our um, politicians to the beginning of the years. A lot of servers also um, were in Germany itself um, that has the data, um, also um, in much, um, uh, much different countries um, where it's more difficult to delete. But at least you should be able um, to, to delete as many of the data as possible. So trying to think about where may it be published, um, who is the provider, who is the internet uh, service provider, um, how can I um, reduce the access, so um, who to call to um, have the data deleted, to maybe block an access or things like that. So really a plan uh, where you can think about, okay, now the um, stuff happened, it's over there, and that are my contact points, what can I do? Of course, you will not bring it out of the internet completely, um, no question, but you can try to, um, especially in the beginning, try to um, reduce the spreading of the information by that. Thank you. One more question? Yes, please, on, the, on your right. So, uh, Kim Hartman from CSRC UK, thank you for your talk, it was very interesting. Just a quick, short question, so if I would summarize your talk, I would say here the message is if you're looking for really um, interesting information on how to spoil military operations and cyberspace operations, you wouldn't look in the dark web. So as a technical person, I know you are, um, where would you be looking? Um. I would uh, use just the uh, traditional Intel channels for that um, because, yeah, they um, they it established for decades, and um, that's a way how to deal with uh, that information. It can be um, that something is also leaked over the dark web, of course, but um, I think the chances we will find such information on the clear net is is much higher. Um, Maybe someone is not thinking about the um, risks when using Tor, 
that it may happen that it's appearing there, but if uh, one is really thinking about um, the risk, the surveillance, uh, the possibilities of de-anonymization, he would not, uh, would not use um, that thing. But yeah, traditional channels. So maybe the clear net, but um, more the traditional uh, direct communication and things like that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you, Robert. I don't think any other questions, and we are running out of time for this part. Thank you very much for your clear presentation of your paper. Really appreciate. It. And of course, you could uh, always approach our speakers in the end of the of the panel during the break to even uh, ask him more detailed questions if you would like to do. So now it's time for our second speaker, Dr. Andrea Malagheri. Andrea is a senior executive vice president at Expert System. His daily duty is focused on intelligence and security solutions for uh, businesses and uh, governmental agencies. And Andrea got a uh, huge experience in coordinating projects that use cognitive computing uh, technologies uh, to support strategic analysis of data. Uh, today, with this presentation, Andrea, uh, presentation uncover dark web identities uh, using artificial intelligence and stylometry with a live demo. Uh, we'll propose the use uh, of artificial intelligence to increase the performance of stylometry uh, applied to the dark web in order to detect or reveal possible threat actors acting in the net. So, Andrea, please, audience is waiting for you. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. So, my intention, as you can read in my title, is to spend much of my time in demonstrating you uh, some live demo. Uh, before doing that, uh, some uh, basic concept about the topic of my discussion. Uh, stylometry is uh, the application of the study of the linguistic style. Okay, so uh, our goal is to use the style of a writer in order to identify it. It's, it's, not a, it's not a new technique. Uh, probably most of you uh, know very well Unabomber, and uh, stylometry played uh, a significant, significant role in solving this uh, investigation. Uh, specifically, um, it uh, has been used to pinpoint the age and the geographic origin of the main suspect, so the famous Ted Kaczynski. Uh, in this specific application, we have uh, three goals. The first one is uh, try to attribute a text to one of the three dark web accounts you can read in the top of this slide. The second goal is to profile the prediction of the age and of the sex. So, uh, how the system works? Uh, we have, uh, obviously, a training data, and in this specific context, we have considered 180 texts, 60 texts for each one of the three guys you saw in the previous slide. The second step is to create a model combining two different artificial intelligence technology. The first one is Cogito technology. My company has developed this technology in the last 20 years. And the second component of the artificial intelligence technique uh, we use is Wika, is a famous open source tool. So then we, we define a prediction, obviously with a confidence level, and then we test and update what we have built in the three main steps. Obviously, after the test, the update is mandatory in order to increase precision and recall. The text we have to consider, so the training data, are very strange text coming from the dark web, where you can find uh, short text, less than 200 characters, medium text, between 200 and 500, and what we have defined long text, more than 500 characters. So, let's try to understand, uh, with the live demo, 
as we can create the semantic parameters, the linguistic style information that we will send to Wika in order to create the prediction. For doing that, I, I love to show you something live. So it, it's not a text coming from the dark web, but uh, it is uh, anyway a good uh, example of uh, what we can do. Let's try to uh, see if the internet connection works, because in this situation, I see some problem. It's a live demo effect, obviously. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, let's try to use another text in order to show you what, what I consider useful for this demonstration. So here we have a text. And when we process a text, uh, Cogito extracts semantic parameters, a lot of semantic parameters. As you can see here, we are considering concepts instead of keywords. So people, because in the text we found Donald Trump, Mike Pence, and so on. Organization, because in the text we found the Republican Party, and so on. Intention verb, decide. Form of thought, reasoning, and so on. So what we did uh, is uh, exactly uh, a very uh, similar approach of uh, our brain does. So you remember during the primary school, we learn about morphological analysis, grammatical analysis, and something different. Here is what you can see. So uh, in the right part of the screen, you see, for example, that uh, was is a form, a, a form of the verb to be. Okay? And every element you can find here has been disambiguated. So we are working using concept. And when we talk about Secretary of State, we know, the artificial intelligence know, that we are talking about uh, a foreign minister, a minister, a politician, a professional people. So what, what we can do here is to extract a lot of linguistic parameters that you can use for understanding the text, the content of the text. For example, here we have extracted some relations. okay, And with the relation, you can find also the different connection, semantic connection, with other entities. So Cogito is able to extract some entities following a very clear process, which is a linguistic analysis. Coming back to the uh, articles talking about uh, what is going on in Israel, I would like to show you what we can extract, because the level of the parameters that you can get is, is much better. And uh, for example, could uh, include uh, what we have named categorization. Why here we are talking about voting? Why here we are talking about parties movement? Or what are the people mentioned here? Can you see that here? You have he, not only Benjamin Netanyahu, but also he. And thanks to this uh, capability, you can also create interesting connection where Benjamin Netanyahu is linked with other entities or is linked with other facts. OK, so with the semantic analysis, you can get very interesting Semantic parameters, entities, relation, emotions, why we have success and uh, liquid party at the same time? Mr. Netanyahu entered negotiation to form a coalition governor after his liquid party won. 
success. So we extract 80 different parameters correlated to emotion. Okay, so uh, Cogito is able to do a lot of things that uh, are correlated to the capability to understand the text. But you can also extract technical parameters that are correlated to the specific linguistic style. Uh, for example, you can say that this text talk about uh, ver these verb classes. For example, a lot of linguistic communication, a lot of verbs correlated to movement. We are talking about uh, grammatical tenses. Simple present is the number one, and just a little bit future. Or we can uh, extract the register and slang we can define a readability index and so on. So at the end of this process, you have a result, which is a, a very rich set of linguistic parameters. For the specific goal, we have considered 200 linguistic parameters, probably too much. So with the linguistic parameter you have, now you can Train the model using Wika. Here we have a text. Finally, we have a text that is not part of the training set, obviously. We used the, to create the model. It is a new text, and it is a text written by Marvin42. Let's try to understand how we can process the text using the combination of the two different tools we have uh, uh, combined. So here we have the text, here we have the model, and what is going on now is uh, the analysis where Cogito extracts the, the semantic parameters that this text contains, and then Weka the machine learning algorithms, try to combine the results of the parameter we have extracted. I don't want to bore you about the parameters, but here is the list of the parameters we are considering now. And uh, for example, in the first uh, column, you can find uh, the specific result. And when you see the green stars, it means that this parameter matches a specific model. In this case, the model of the people that Wika is associated to the order of the text. So here we are saying that probably this is the confidence level. Probably Marvin42 wrote this text, and the confidence level is pretty good. This, this is not the precision. This is the confidence level coming from weak. Eh? We are not so confident about the age. We think that is probably in the 40s. But you see, 38% of confidence level is not too much. And we think he is a male. OK, so let's try to recap. We, we have a, a training set of data, 60 documents. Uh, from Marvin, this grant, uh, and Orange, the free dark web accounts. We have extracted the semantic parameters with Cogito. With Wika, we have uh, created a model, and this is the result. Coming back to the slide, some comments about uh, what we have, uh, we have built. So first of all, the precision and the recall, when I talk about precision, I consider the more relevant results that the system um, uh, return us. When I consider recall, I hope to get most of the re relevant results. I don't want to miss a lot of uh, useful information. And uh, using just 180 text, just few text, 
The level of precision is 78%. And also the recall is not bad. So, uh, a good starting point, I would say. But a suggestion for you comes from the combination of stylometry and uh, this type of goal, so the de-anonymizing programmer's uh, task. Uh, it is a paper uh, published uh, on 2015. You can easily find all the information about this paper. I'm not correlated to this paper, but I would like to highlight some conclusion about this paper. So they wrote that the goal was to understand the source code authors of C++ source code. Take a look at the result. Considering 1,600 people, 94% of precision, not bad. So you can apply stylometry not only on a text written by dark web accounts, but it seems that also the programmers have their linguistic style. Second slide. Uh, the, it is easier to identify difficult programming tasks, and at the same time, the skilled programmer is something that you can identify with more precision. So, a provocation for you. They write that stylometry could be applied to malicious code. Could this technique help you just a little bit to solve the famous problem of the attribution of the malware? Again, it, this is <laughs> a suggestion for you. I had this last slide. So, conclusion. Stylometry can be useful for you. Dark, uh, for uncovered dark web accounts, probably reading the paper I showed you before, also for profiling malicious code uh, authors. Second, extracting manually 200 semantic parameters is not exactly <laughs> an easy task. So the human analysis that is now the common tool, it is low and it is expensive. And uh, my conclusion is that combining, probably in a better way, artificial intelligence technology for automatically extracting the semantic parameter and for using machine learning in order to predict the authorship using the semantic parameter could be faster and cheaper. Don't forget <laughs> my last note. We are not talking about replacing human analysis. Artificial intelligence works pretty good, but now my position is that we can consider in this context to augment the human capabilities. Thank you. So, do we have any questions for Andrea? I hope that the consideration regarding the, the way how to bind using those kind of capability to bind the possible uh, uh, malware uh, programmers could be really interesting for uh, even uh, uh, further discussion here in our five minutes question. Yes, we got one. Uh, okay, well, sorry, please. <laughs> um, 
Thank you. Uh, I do have a question. Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I am here. Sorry, but guy, yeah. completely. So the question is the following. You are in the dark side uh, of the room. I, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I am the, the well. I am in the Tor network. Yeah. Uh, okay. My question is the following. You know, it seems to me, and correct me if I am wrong, you have a kind of two major problems, issues that you solved. First is a contextual analysis and semantic analysis, and you use some semantic or, or conceptual graphs to identify the meaning of the text. And second part, you use some st statistical linguistic, uh, you know, keywords or, or to identify the attribution, uh, you know, who, who you know, who is a person. So my question is following is, overall, it's a linear process. You first do text, semantic analysis of the text, and after that, you do, you do the attribution, or this is a kind of uh, multi-step, but iterative process that first do semantics, then do a little bit statistical analy uh, but analysis, get better at what understanding, and start semantic analysis, in, but in a loop. A very good question, thank you. So uh, our experience is uh, in performing uh, cognitive computing semantic analysis tools, okay? We have a limited experience in machine learning methods, but obviously we, we, we use them. Um, my, my idea is that uh, putting the text directly inside Wika cannot grant you the same level of precision. Okay, so uh, text analysis is, cannot be based on keyword analysis. Must be a semantic analysis. And uh, the combination of uh, two different artificial intelligence tools, the first one that can produce the semantic parameters that are important for you for this type of goal could something that can create the best condition for the second step for the machine learning prediction. Okay, so our experience is that uh, the different nuances you can find out uh, in a text is not something that you can manage with a statistic heuristic approach. Okay, you have to prepare the data and uh, again, we are still considering uh, uh, which semantic parameter we have to use. Because now we have gathered all the semantic parameters and we have ingested inside Wika. Probably we have to select them in a different way and probably we have to weight with different value the semantic parameter I showed you before. But no way from Considering uh, our experience, uh, my opinion is that uh, it's a really, really challenging task, and you must to face it combining different technologies. Uh, we, we, we uh, honestly speaking, we should try to uh, increase the training data set with more than 60 texts for each uh, dark web accounts. And then we can understand more. But the first result is something that uh, I consider very positive to, to, to understand more about this type of application. I, I guess that we have another question from the audience. Yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'd like to have two questions. One is, uh, how did you get the uh, samples or data set? So you need uh, some a lot of data set for machine learning. So that's why uh, actually it's very difficult to correct uh, uh, correct answer, a correct data set. So how so, did you, uh, yeah, how the, many? The, 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 in, the, in this specific situation, we, we have used a dark web uh, uh, gather search engine that uh, acquired uh, the different uh, text uh, issued by the three different uh, people we have focused on, okay? So uh, it, it could be also manually mm, mm, copy and paste if you want, but in this case we have uh, set up a crawler for acquiring documents. 
it is not so easy to find out uh, many texts in the dark web, because uh, as you have uh, completely understood, uh, the volume, the length of the test uh, is important, OK? Uh, so this type of techniques, uh, stylometry, works better if you have uh, long text. If you have just few words, it's not, it's not so simple to identify your style of yeah. writing. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, but uh, I'd like to ask, uh, so the how did you get uh, uh, samples or data set? Uh, so we we, crawl, we yeah. crawl the sample from yes. the dark web. And, but uh, it's uh, uh, not so, how do you say, uh, the, uh, you imagine or estimate something, but uh, you need some uh, correct ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we consider a blog, a blog yeah. present on the dark web where the free accounts uh -huh. posted the text, OK? But and so he, he declared the, uh, the man or agenda or age. So ah, this, oh, oh, got so I got, uh, sorry. Uh, for, for understanding if, he, if he's a man or, or if he's 30, 40s, 50s, and so on, we have another sample, uh, sample text, OK? Ah. We have three different training data. One for uh, ah, okay. understanding sex. And here we have more text that we know that are, ah, okay. are produced by so 20 years old guys or 50 years old guys, or female and male. Ah, okay. And the f about the free uh, accounts, dark web accounts, we have uh, crawled their content. Ah, okay. And we have used other content to measure. Okay. The, how how the many did you use the uh, number of uh, samples? How, how many? 60, 60 text for each uh, uh, account. So globally, 180 text. For, for machine learning? For yeah. Run no, no, for, for semantic parameters, mm. and then for ma machine learning, too, obviously. I would like to ask some, the whole number of uh, your samples or... Uh, so considering the free dark web account, 180. Considering sex and ages, uh, thousands. Ah, OK. I can suggest if you would like to get some more detailed information to talk with uh, Andrea, maybe more in deep, uh, even during our break. So we still have time, one minute for one more question, if we had. Yes, see someone in the, yeah, in the end of the, the rear of the room. Just uh, really quick. Uh, so my question is, is this uh, technique also usable to identify uh, let's say, fake news or information warfare, and uh, how it would also uh, respond to the uh, machine learning doctored texts, and would it be possible to identify those as well? Thank you. Very, very good question, very good question. Uh, we, have implement, we have already implemented this technique for uh, detecting fake news when the, they are generating by, automatically by tools, OK? This is the perfect uh, um, situation where you have something, tools, that can generate fake news in order to disinformate. And uh, obviously, the, the tools that uh, an algorithm can, can produce are really, really well <laughs> characterized by something that is not the human uh, style of writing text. So this is a, a typical application of uh, of stylometry together with artificial intelligence. Also, inside social media intelligence, you can do the same. For example, you have uh, many Twitter accounts where you have uh, simply a nickname, Mickey Mouse 42, and you want to understand if uh, you can find out the model you built using Mickey Mouse tweets is something that you can use in an open source. So you can understand that Mickey Mouse 42 in the open source intelligence is Andrea Melegari, for example. And then you can combine Mickey Mouse 42 with a specific person. So thank you, Andrea. Really appreciate your dynamic uh, Dime Lib live demo.